Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and I just played etude number one from the Jacques Delacluse book, A Dozen Etudes for Snare Drum. This is a very famous book, and it's one of the best classical snare drum books that you'll find. I use this regularly with my students. Now, there's lots of great classical snare drum books. So everybody knows of the Cerrone book. That's a classic. Also, the Mitchell, Mitchell Peters books are great. Garbert Whaley books, Fred Albright books goes on and on. There's, you know, probably 50 books out there that you can get. The Delacluse books are normally used uh, for upper undergraduate students or graduate students. And if you do an orchestral audition, many times one of those will be asked. So over some time here in the next couple months, I'll be posting these and talking about them because they're very important. Now, uh, for that Etude, I was using a pair of sticks that I make. They're um, leopard wood and they're about 70 grams. I like a heavier stick to play this kind of stuff. They feel secure in my hands. If I ever get a little nervous when I'm playing with the orchestra, I feel like, you know, I have some weight there. I also like a small barrel tip uh, for this kind of music. It gives me a lot of articulation and it's also really good for rolls. We'll talk about those things in a minute. Now you heard that version with a click. In a moment here, you'll hear it without the click. Most of these uh, Delacluse etudes have a little retardando uh, close to the end. So the click has to be programmed and then shut off and then come back on. So that's tricky, but I wanted to put the click on so you can hear how that sounds with the correct timing and the correct tempo. Now, I know that a, that a lot of you have seen me play hundreds of uh, rudimental etudes on my channel here. But also, you may not know, I am an orchestral snare drummer. I have, uh, you know, a symphony orchestra I regularly play with, not so much these days because of COVID. But that's something I've been doing. And I used to take orchestral auditions when I was in my 20s and uh, seems like forever ago. And also, I've been lucky enough to sit in on a number of orchestral auditions when we've auditioned uh, percussionists and timpanists and so forth. So I kind of know what, what to look for. And uh, the biggest thing that you have to remember when you're doing those kinds of auditions is that you're going to be most likely behind a curtain. In other words, no one's going to see you, but they're going to hear you. And the biggest problem that I've seen and heard with uh, percussionists is uh, their roles for snare drum. Normally snare drum, xylophone, maybe a little glockenspiel are asked in the first round of the orchestral percussion auditions. And if the roles aren't good and the dynamic control isn't good, we'll basically cut those folks right away uh, and not have them hang around. So it's very important you have really good roles, really good articulation, really good timing, and very special dynamics where you could play a whisper and really loud without you uh, losing your sense of time. So these Delacluse etudes really demonstrate all of that. Now, it doesn't matter which one you, you study. You should study all 12 of them, but all of them are very difficult. And this book does get more difficult as it goes on. Normally for our auditions, we'll ask number nine, as do many other orchestras. So today we're going to talk about some of those things. Now, most orchestral percussionists will bring their own snare drum to the audition, but sometimes an orchestra will want you to use their drum. So be prepared for that. Now, this drum I'm using is a Pearl Philharmonic drum with a calf head. That's what I prefer to play on. It makes it a little more difficult to play on, but it's a nice, thick sound. Sometimes the rolls can be tricky. So if you're going to play on a calf head, you probably want to practice uh, as much as possible. So if they're going to have a drum with a calf head at the audition, make sure you practice on one because it feels completely different than a plastic head. And in a lot, of, a lot of ways, it's more difficult to play because it kind of sucks you in. It's like playing on an old K Zildjian where, you know, it's very loose in a way. The weather affects it. So you'll have to keep tuning it up if it's a humid day. And if it's in the winter, you may want to tune it down. But again, these, these uh, heads sound great. This is a Lafima head. This is the kind of head that I prefer and uh, that you can purchase those online. They're rather expensive, but that's what I recommend. Also, uh, I like these Pearl Philharmonic drums. They're pretty much uh, foolproof. 
they all sound good this particular one is a five inch by 14 drum it's got a um, pearl white finish as you see and it's got that throw off uh, where it has three different snares I'll see what tell you what I got in here I put some curly snares on here today so you could hear what that sounds like and uh, the other snares are cable metal and coated so let's talk about this etude this is number one and over time I'll be doing probably all of these in the book now let's talk about some interpretation of uh, things in this solo solo number one in general with an orchestra you want to play your drags and roughs pretty closed uh, much more close than you would play them in a rudimental etude so in other words a rudimental etude drag would sound like this or a classical drag would sound like this now sometimes conductors will want to hear that note so you can play that a little more open or you can play it really closed okay so you know if they say something to you you know do what they say <laughs> don't argue with them ever the main thing is that it's never behind and if you play them open there's a chance of them getting behind because you're so far back in the orchestra it, everything almost can be perceived as being late so always stay on top of that so um i'm playing these particular drags and roughs in this etude pretty closed so it opens with this statement So that's an eight bar phrase and that's going somewhere it's going to the end of that second stanza so the dynamic keeps getting stronger and stronger and finally you've arrived and that's the statement which comes back later it's kind of a recapitulation these solos are very very musical and most of them have a main theme that comes back and then there's variations on that theme you see that I'm playing my 32nd notes pretty close together or I should say 16th notes and I'm playing them almost as 30 second notes. So, as opposed to, and that's the same reason. Most orchestras will phrase like, bup, but a bup, but a bup, but a bup. If you want a good example of that, you can listen to Beethoven 7 and the timpani part. Bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum. That's the phrasing you always want to use. Uh, when you're playing with an orchestra and just listen that's the best thing to do listen to the horns listen to you know the winds uh, don't listen to the strings <laughs> but listen to the, those the wind instruments and you want to match them as close as possible so you want to play all those 16th notes towards the 32nd note side now once again all the flams are done in a closed manner not like a rudimental flam it needs to be tight all right so again so you're not late and it's just a thickening of the sound now this etude has lots and lots of dynamics and you need to really exaggerate those it's extremely important so it should go from a whisper to extremely loud now there's no pianissimos I can't remember if there are any I don't think so in this etude and there's no for, uh, fortissimos there's just piano and forte but you want to create kind of a dynamic uh, guideline for yourself when you start so your pianissimo uh, should be you know very soft and your forte or, or fortissimo should be very loud and everything in between so you have to use a scale when you do that and you need to practice like that you also notice I was doing some hand gestures with that like this so that really helps me phrase when I do that kind of movement and that's something you don't have to do but I really enjoy doing that I think it looks really good when I was a kid I used to go see the New York Philharmonic all the time and I, I saw Buster Bailey play and uh, one of my teachers Walter Rosenberger play and when they played they had style you know they they, they looked good as well as played well and what you heard you saw and that's a really important thing to me personally again you don't have to do that now you'll also notice that I'm using lots of wrist when I play these. So if you watch my rudimental etudes, I don't use that much wrist. I use a lot of fingers and bounce 
obviously. But for this, you want to use a lot of risk because it's all about control. And especially when you play soft, you play so soft on the edge of the drum, that's all wrist. So you'll need to practice that. Now, uh, in a lot of his, or Delacruz's solos, he has a little retardando there almost to the end before you come back with the main theme. You can do a lot or little. You can stretch it if you want, or you could just do poco, which means little. So uh, that's up to you. You can do a multo retard there, that's fine. It's your interpretation of these solos. So uh, as I post these, I'll talk about them um, one by one. Now in this particular solo, you have a lot of upbeats. So 16th notes that go, um, When you do that kind of thing, you want to use one hand for every repeated upbeat, always. Don't try to alternate that. In fact, one thing I do is when I have repeated notes many times, I'll use the same hand. And again, that's a lot different than rudimental drumming, where you're always pretty much alternating. So don't be afraid to use the same hand as much as you can, because you want it to sound exactly the same. And no matter how perfect your hands are, they're never going to sound exactly the same, both of them. It's just not going to happen. So if you use one hand, it will sound exactly the same if you have several notes uh, together like this. Now let's take a minute and talk about rolls. All your rolls should be measured so you can play them in time. You have to have a plan. Now conductors are notoriously not consistent in their tempos, especially from rehearsals to concerts. So again, if you find that the conductor is getting nervous and playing fast or conducting fast, you want to be able to have a plan to fix that. My plan is always that I can start a roll either from my right hand or my left hand and end on either hand. That gets me out of any kind of jam. In this particular solo and many Delacluse solos, the rolls don't actually end. He'll just leave them. So if you look at uh, this solo and you look at the last line, Those rolls stop, and when you stop them, you want to stop them on the 16th right before the next note, but you don't hit that note. You lift up. Okay, so that's what that means. And again, there's different interpretations of these things. You'll hear two different players still play it a little bit or sometimes completely different. That's okay. If you're in an orchestra and you're doing your job and everybody's happy, it's right. Don't worry about it. Okay, there's no exact right way or wrong way with an interpretation. So, you know, be flexible. That's the moral of that story. But again, when a roll's not tied, just lift up. Also, a lot of my students, one problem they have is they accent the end of all their rolls. So don't do that unless it's written. You, there's a difference between an ending and an accent. So I'll show you that. Here's an ending. And here's an accent. All right, so you don't want to pop it too hard at the end there. And that could become a habit, so be really careful with that. So now I'll play this solo, uh, and I'll give you a close-up of my hands without the click. So I hope you enjoyed this, and we'll do all of these eventually. Uh, they're very, very important. You should study this book if you want to be an orchestral percussionist. All right, take care.